All right, well, welcome everyone again. Thank you for taking the time to come here this morning and listen to my presentation on automatic activation devices. I'm gonna spend the next hour with you here sharing just thoughts and observations on AEDs and what they mean to us as sports skydivers, professional skydivers, tandem skydivers, and give you an opportunity to possibly be exposed to some information that you may or may not have seen or heard uh, in the last few years. Ultimately though, what I would ask of everybody in the room is don't take anything that I'm saying as fact. Simply because I'm standing up here with a microphone and a shirt that has my name on it. All I'm asking you to do is think about the information I'm presenting. After the presentation's over, if you go back to your home drop zones and talk to the other skydivers that you skydive with, the other staff members you work with, if you continue the conversation, Long after this presentation is over, then I will consider the next hour or so that we're spending together a success. I'm just here to present information for your consideration and allow you to take that information and make your own, draw your own conclusions from it. I'm gonna show a number of videos. Uh, we have permission, I should say, majority of the videos are all public domain videos, things that you can see on YouTube, on Facebook feeds, things like that. There's only one video that we're gonna show today that I'm gonna have the camera turned off on. It's just. Um, preference of the person that provided it to us, but they are pr providing it to us for the opportunity for you to see it first person and to learn from that. So that's basically how the next hour is going to go. We're going to go through a bunch of different aspects of automatic activation devices and we'll end with some conclusions. And if there's time left, we'll have a question and answer session. Okay, sound good? So why am I here? The reason I'm here is that it's my belief that there's been a shift in mentality over the years about what an AED means to the sports skydiver today or the professional skydiver today. When AEDs were first introduced in the mid-1990s, they had a philosophy of set it and forget it. They were installed and they were designed to be turned on at the beginning of the day and forgotten about. Quick show of hands, has anybody ever heard the term set it and forget it when it comes to their AEDs? Okay. Any skydivers here from the mid-1990s? Remember a time before AEDs, after AEDs? So you understand where I'm coming from. When the AEDs were first introduced, it was supposed to be something that we turned on and never thought about again. It was supposed to just be there in the highly unlikely event that it was ever to be uh, needed or activated. While I'm having you guys exercise so early in the morning, raising your hands, anybody ever uh, seen an AED activation or have a friend that's had one, witnessed one on a drop zone? Well, quite a few people, okay? Now, <laughs> Anywhere in the world, if we ask that question, we'll get the same response. There are a lot of AED activations going on. Now, what we know about AEDs, in, in theory, is that they're really only designed to be a last resort of sorts, right? It's that last possible moment where a parachute can be put over our head that the AED is designed to activate, in theory. Would you guys agree with that? Nod of your head. Yet a lot of hands went up, so that means that a lot of people have seen or, or know someone that's been in that last case, worst case, last moment scenario, right? Well, not always. There's other issues, other reasons why AEDs might activate as well, which we're gonna cover. But the reason I put the slide up here is that today, the idea of set it and forget it when it comes to your automatic activation devices is no longer applicable. It's an archaic philosophy from an archaic time. Today, we're in modern skydiving scenarios using modern equipment. The actual structure of the AEDs themselves, the software, the programming, the designs, all of that is so much further evolved from when it was first introduced. And it's our job as skydivers to understand that process and that evolution because ultimately we're the ones that are relying on these units that we choose to jump on our, our kits to save our lives if it's ever put in that position to have to do so. So always good to start with a visual reference.
This is a great video because it paints a picture of what the traditional AAD activation would look like based on a loss of altitude awareness. So I think if you, were to, if you were to interview or to ask most sports skydivers, why is their AED on their back turned on? <laughs> yeah. Altitude awareness just a little bit late. If you were to ask most skydivers why their AEDs are on their back, it's for that unconscious scenario where you've been knocked out on a free fly jump or knocked out on a wingsuit jump, and you personally are incapacitated. Come on in. Yep, please welcome. You personally are incapacitated and unable to activate your reserve, and that's what it's there for, that last resort. However, that's the rare event. The majority of AED activations tend to look more like this, a loss of altitude awareness, a situational con loss of situational control, resulting in an unintended AED activation. So I keep saying AED, what does that mean? An AED is an automatic activation device. <coughs> Put simply, it's an electronical mechanical device. It's a calculator of sorts that has a cigar cutter type mechanism inside of it, a cylinder and a blade. It doesn't get excited when you go low. It doesn't get scared. What did you say? You were getting uncomfortable watching that? Yep. The AED doesn't get uncomfortable. It doesn't care. It's just doing a lot of math. That's all that machine, that electronical machine is designed to do. And what math is it doing? A few times a second, it's trying to analyze changes in air pressure and those changes in air pressure, or air density, we'll call it air pressure, that changes in air pressure, the changes are calculated into speed and altitude based on what the barometric pressure is on the ground when it's turned on, it's climbed to altitude and it's descent. So all it's trying to do is determine if it's meeting a certain set of parameters based on that math. How fast am I going and at what altitude am I going at? And if it believes that it has met those parameters, it will activate like we saw in that video. But I want to tell you a story. A friend of mine, personal friend that I've known for many, many years, he was skydiving in the winter. And what do winter skydivers do? They wear gloves, right? And he doesn't usually jump with gloves. It's the first winter jump of the season. And after an uneventful two or three way, he turns and tracks and he can't find his hacky because of his glove. So at that point, he goes for his reserve. After trying to find his mane unsuccessfully, he also cannot deploy his reserve because of his gloves. What do you think came next? He settled into a neutral body position and waited for the AED to fire. Okay. Thankfully, the AED did fire. A reserve parachute opened, and it saved his life. It's a mechanical device, just like a cell phone. It's prone to failures. It's prone to being put into any possible situation outside of that perfect scenario where it works and thankfully in the situation that I just described all the forces aligned in the universe and that AED activation did end up saving his life but we've had a number of activations over the years we're going to talk about why later we've had a number of activations over the years where the outcome was not a fully deployed reserve parachute and that's the goal of the AED all it's designed to do is push a cutter through a cylinder that may or may not cut a loop if that loop is installed at or below a specific altitude, at or above a specific speed, if all of those calculations are determined to be correct. Once that happens, that guillotine effect occurs, which I think we're all familiar with, that only starts the reserve deployment process. It does not guarantee us a reserve parachute. Would you guys agree? Okay, that only initiates the system, the process of reserve deployment. It does not guarantee one. So I like to frame the AED like a coffee pot. If we were to look at it like an everyday regular appliance, an AED is just like the, your pot of coffee that you have made every morning before you go to work. The reason why I use this reference is that AED actually has two jobs. The first job we're very familiar with, it's the one that I just described, the guillotine process, the activation sequence, if you will. But what do you think the other job of an AED is? 
Any thoughts? Any guesses? To not activate when it's not in a position to need to do so, right? The coffee pot's primary job is to what? Make coffee. But its secondary job is to not burn the house down after it's done making the coffee, to shut itself off, to, to not activate when it's not required to. So a lot of these AD activations that we see in the field today are based on a lack of understanding of the secondary job of that AD not to activate in scenarios that it's not intended to activate in. But how does that happen? We, the end user of the equipment, find new and extraordinary ways to put our AEDs in situations that they weren't designed for to activate outside of their envelope of intended use. So hopefully now you'll think about your AED in two terms, the job that it's intended to do and also keeping it out of environments, allowing it to activate when it's not needed to activate. So the AED has three basic functions or three basic parameters. It has an arming altitude, it has an activation altitude, and it has a disarming altitude. Now they vary between uh, manufacturers of sorts. I'm going to show you a couple uh, examples of that in a moment. But what we need to understand as end users, as the people with these AEDs on our back, is simply that turning the AED on does not guarantee an activation is going to occur if the parameters are met. The first thing that your AED has to do is arm itself. How does it arm itself? Anybody have any thoughts or ideas? And there's no wrong answers in this room. So if anybody has any thoughts or ideas, well, I might give you some wrong answers, but you guys can't give me any bad information. What does arming mean? What's your thought on arming of an AED and an uh, automatic activation device? It measures, measures the air pressure. It's decreased at a certain rate between two and five, and it gets to a certain height, so it doesn't complete the citrus. It then will allow itself to fire if the other parameters are met. That's the, the end of that statement is what we're looking for. If an automatic activation device achieves a certain altitude after it's been turned on, it will consider itself in flight and able to activate if the parameters are met. So how many people in here have AEDs in their, their back pads, in their harness containers? Almost everybody, wonderful. Without raising your hand, just ask yourself, do I know the arming altitude of my AED? Whether it's a Vigil, Vigil 2, Vigil 2 Plus, Quattro, Cypress 2, Mars, Mars is it Mars 2? That's one of the new ones out there today, M2. If you have an AED in your back, and you don't know what the arming altitude of your AED is, that's your first homework assignment, is to, once the, this is over, maybe even now on your smartphone after we get done, download the manual and find out what your arming altitude is. Everybody knows what the activation altitude is. That's when the, the cutter action occurs if the parameters are met. This cylinder will have a cutter push through it. Activation altitudes, we're gonna spend a little more time as we get into the presentation on the different types of activation altitudes, but we all understand that the activation altitude, that's the critical moment. That's the moment where the unit has made a calculation that it has met or exceeded both the speed and altitude requirements, exceeded the speed and gone through an altitude uh, hard deck that it believes that it has now reached or exceeded a capacity that you no longer have the opportunity to initiate a reserve deployment in a timely manner, and it takes over that process by initiating an activation. And now, the we all knew that. I just spent the last 90 seconds telling you guys something you already know. But why did I do that? Because it brings me to the disarming function. The disarming function is just as critical as the activation function because it is possible to have an AD activation after our main parachutes have already been deployed. Do you guys agree with that statement or not? Somebody tell me why and how. Could I have a cutaway? Absolutely, we could break away, you could have a canopy collision, and you're breaking away at a lower altitude than you had intended to. What else? There's something else I'm looking for here. Swoopers. swoopers. Who said swooping? Okay. Anyone here ever seen or heard or know of someone that's activated an AD through a big performance turn on a small parachute? I'm going to pause for one second. Okay, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's 20 people in this room that have raised their hands. We've lost more than one skydiver over the years due to an AD activation during a swoop. Anyone here know someone who's, who's died from that? Thankfully, not as many hands have gone up, but it, it's happened more than once. We know it's a possibility, and it continues to happen. So the disarming altitude of the AD for higher performance parachute pilots is a critical component of understanding how the AD functions with their gear. 
and then also, as was brought up in the beginning of this part of the conversation, low altitude breakaways, the ones we never intend to have happen because of canopy collisions and uh, late canopy flight equipment problems, low altitude cutaways, the disarming altitude also has a role in that knowledge base as well. So let's take a moment and talk about some individual AEDs, just to give you a um, framework of the parameters. The Vigil 1 and the Vigil 2 have an arming altitude of 150 feet. The plane takes off, it, it climbs past 150 feet, assuming you turn the unit on on the ground. It will arm itself after 150 feet. We exit the aircraft in a belly to earth orientation. It will activate at 840 feet. On your back, it will activate at 1,100 feet. We'll talk about why in a few minutes. It disarms at 150 feet. So at 130 feet, if that unit is dropped out of an airplane and it meets or exceeds the parameters, will it fire? No, it will not, in theory. I say in theory because all these calculations are just that, calculations. Across the board of all these AD manufacturers, all these units, there is no absolute hard true altitude. All these calculations are being made based on multiple samples of air pressure changes each second. Vigil 2 Plus and the Quattro, arming altitude is 1,000 feet. Activation remains the same, 840 feet and 1,100 feet on your back, 840 for belly, 1,100 on your back. And the disarming altitude is 150 feet above the ground. Cypress 2 is similar characteristics. Arms at 1,500 feet, so plane has to climb past 1,500 feet. Its belly to earth activation is 750 feet. Its back activation is 1,000 feet, so approximately 250 to 260 foot difference. That's the trend we're seeing between an AED activating on your belly versus an AED activating on your back. It's an important piece of information which we're going to revisit in about 15 minutes. The AED will activate higher because of the pressure difference on your back than it will on your belly because of how it's interpreting, how it's doing the math on the change of the altitude, change of pressures during that descent. And the Cypress 2 will disarm at 130 feet. Why do I not have Cypress or Cypress 1 up here on this slide? They're all timed out. Yes, the 15, plus, 15 years plus or minus six months has gone by for the original Cypress units. Do any of you guys travel internationally? This is important to know. You might find yourself in a country somewhere else around the world that has units that may still be installed in equipment, whether the information didn't get to them or they are choosing to jump them anyway. If you have a set of gear that goes down, you have a cutaway and someone hands you another parachute to jump in a foreign country and there's a Cypress 1 in it, what do we do? We don't jump it. It's out of date, it's out of its service window. In 1995 or 96, when the first AEDs came out, they turned on and they turned off. You had sport units, you had tandem units, you had student units. Today we have multi-mode units pretty much across the board, but what we want to look at here is different types of units that are available to us as skydivers. We have our sport or pro unit, which the majority of us will use. Tandem instructors, how many tandem instructors in the room? We have separate units and separate parameters or modes for tandem. What's the difference, the basic difference in sport versus tandem? Hank, put you on the spot. Oh, the army altitude is higher. Army altitude is higher, yes, and higher, higher activation altitude, okay. Student AADs, what does a student AAD do? Any AFF instructors out there, what's the basic concept of a student activation AAD, automatic activation device? Yeah, the student AEDs will activate at a slower airspeed based on those calculations. The swoop mode, the swoop AED, has become one of the most critical additions to the AED community over the last few years because of the situation we just talked about, swoop activations, that is, introduction of the swoop AED has drastically reduced the number of swoop-related AED activations. Has it eliminated it? No, nope, we're still seeing AD activations today from high performance turns, despite the fact we know that can happen, despite the fact we know that can be fatal, and despite the fact we have dedicated equipment that will essentially prevent that from happening, but it's still happening today. Ask yourself why. The answer is probably going to be somewhere in the range of 
like I said, not having a full basic understanding of the parameters that we put these automatic activation devices through as we use them. And last but not least, wingsuit. Do we have wingsuit AEDs out there yet? I think they're starting to come out of the market, okay? It remains to be seen where wingsuit AEDs will go, how slow we go. Um, you know, we were talking this morning about AEDs, our wingsuits could potentially even climb now, you know, so the functionality of a wingsuit AED, we'll see in the future how good or how bad that is within the industry. Um, but the fact is we recognize that there is a slow fall rate component of wingsuits. So the potential for a wingsuit AED is there. We mentioned briefly tandem a moment ago. Tandem instructors, again, to call on you to raise your hands. Are you guys confident here and now that you understand the arming altitude, the activation altitudes, and the deactivation or disarming altitudes of the tandem ADs as it compares to your sport AD. And you guys have multiple units on your drop zone. Maybe you have Vigil 2s and Cypress 2s on some of the systems. Anybody jumping multiple AEDs? Okay. Do they have the same activation altitudes? The same arming altitudes? Okay. Homework assignment number two. If you are a tandem instructor in this room, we need to determine what AEDs are in our tandem systems, download the manuals, and find out what the arming and activation and disarming altitudes are of our tandem units. I can tell you, I'll give you the, the first one, the arming altitudes are quite different between the two. So knowing when the systems are arming is a critical component being a tandem instructor in your knowledge base. So let's get back to the belly or back question. We mentioned earlier, as we were going through the activation parameters of the systems, that they'll activate at approximately 840 feet or 750 feet on your belly, and they'll activate at approximately 1,100 feet or 1,000 feet on your back. Why is that? The reason is the pressure changing. And in the worst case scenario, if you are on your back, incapacitated, or perhaps you just have lost focus on your skydive, you're, you have all your faculties, but you're falling on your back towards the earth, and you recognize at that last moment that you have to turn over and deploy your reserve, the pressure change from falling on your back to about 800 feet or so, rolling over onto your belly, can have an effect on the system. Because that math that's going on, all those calculations, they get thrown out of whack when we go from our back to our belly at that last moment during the activation. I'm gonna show you a video to illustrate that very situation. So, what that ends up being, I termed it the rollover effect. Drastic massive change in pressure in a critical moment during the activation window. What could be the result of that? I'm gonna ask you to turn the camera off if you would. This is the one video that has been given to us for educational purposes on the first person basis, but the preference of the owner and person in the video is that it not be published on the internet at this point in time. You can turn the camera back on if you, you can turn on if you want. We're back to things that can be <coughs> things that are from the public domain. Okay. I thought only base jumpers could say that. <laughs> so here we have a skydiver. This is also on uh, the I Love Skydiving .com or Friday Freakouts, one of those public skydiving videos where it's uh, we see all the crazy things going on in the world this first person point of view the skydiver does not have their chest strap attached okay not a great position to be in but they end up fixating on the chest strap they lose altitude awareness and we're going to see a reserve deployment on his back in that high pressure scenario And there's the it, it activation. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Chest strap. <laughs> chest strap 1,000. Don't worry about your landing. It's not like it's not well, you know, as, as comical as that is, it's object fixation. It's, he's in a life-threatening scenario. The reserve parachute is open, and the first thing he's thinking about still 
is the chest strap. So we can see the results. Two skydivers who lost altitude awareness, two skydivers who were plummeting to the earth on their back that had AD activations. One of them rolled over. <laughs> One of them rolled over at approximately 800, 700 feet and caused a drastic, massive pressure change at that critical moment. The other one didn't. The other one had the activation on their back. And we saw the time difference in canopy rides between the two of them. Five, six, seven, eight second difference in canopy ride, which can be translated to a differential in the height at which the activations actually occurred. So does that all make sense to you guys, what that rollover can do if you find yourself? Yes, sir. Yes, they were both the same AD units. Yeah. So this brings us into descent rates. Originally, when AEDs were first conceived of or, of or invented, we had one kind of skydiving, right? Belly to earth. The only people that were free flyers were people that couldn't get stable, right? They were just swimming all over the sky. Belly to earth, box man, 120 mile an hour, or what you guys would call here 180 kilometers an hour. They're about right. Miles an hour, you got miles an hour? Awesome. 120 miles an hour, and that's what the parameters were essentially set for for AEDs in the beginning because that was what we did. That's how we skydived at 120 miles an hour. But today, our descent rates are incredibly varied. Wingsuits can go as slow as 20 miles an hour. Um, we've even seen some videos of them pulling up into climbs uh, in some of the larger, more pro suits out there. Free flying, we can fly at 180, 190, 200 miles an hour. And all the varying speeds in between, sit flying, back flying, shoulder flying, hand flying, whatever kind of flying you're doing out there, we can f achieve any speed between that maximum head down velocity versus the slowest wingsuits. The key here is that our fall rate is variable throughout that envelope. It's no longer just an approximate 120 mile an hour, um, 120 mile an hour basis for that AD to be designed at. And we also can now add canopies into that equation. I saw something on Facebook a couple of days ago. One of our swoopers in Florida, he entered the pond or entered the gates over the pond at 97 miles an hour. Some people skydive at less than 97 miles per hour. We have canopies going that fast now. It's crazy. So we have all these different velocities that the, in the AD, again, we go back to the, all it's doing is math. It's a basic, simple process of altitude and, and speed, but we're putting it in all these different scenarios and tasking it to be able to determine them all. Here we have a wingsuiter with a main canopy malfunction and cannot get to his reserve handle. Does not have an RSL attached or hooked up. Apparently there was a point in time where on some of these larger suits the handles could get sucked inside the suit, certain types models. Apparently that was the situation in this particular incident. So, Breaking away from a malfunctioning main parachute without access to the reserve handle, what did this wingsuiter do? <coughs> he went head down and attempted to accelerate to a speed fast enough for his AED to activate. And there he is, he's got a, a reserve over his head. So. <coughs> I want to put this in context though. Think about all of the, and I hate to use the term failures, but that truly is, to be honest, where we are in the sport. The thought process failures in place to find yourself in a position to have to increase your speed towards the earth without an ability to manually activate a parachute in hopes that a mechanical electronical device will do it for you. The planning on that jump could not have been perfect. 
this, there were flaws there somewhere, would you agree? The inability to reach a reserve handle, not jumping with an RSL. Anybody that was in our uh, tandem meeting yesterday, incidents are always the logical conclusion of a series of illogical acts and decisions. Not jumping a suit that ensured the, the uh, availability of the reserve handle, not jumping with an RSL. But give them credit for recognizing the fact that there have been a lot of questions over the years do wingsuits generate enough forward speed or downward velocity to initiate an activation? It's quite possible that a large suit could fall through 750 feet or 840 feet and be going slow enough and have a large enough burble behind them that that calculation process may or may not result in initiation of an activation. So for all of the things that led up to that fact, the, 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 the fact that the individual had the foresight, if you want to call it, to ensure his airspeed was as high as it could be before it activated to bridge that gap, that's pretty impressive someone could keep that much uh, mental focus at a position, you know, in that period in time. So that brings us to the AED swoop fire. That photo came off of Facebook a couple years ago. Somebody had um, put a message on their Facebook page, my AED unit didn't work. My AED unit misfired, that famous word misfire. Okay. The AED was placed in the position where its forward or its downward velocity, its interpretation of its speed towards the earth exceeded the parameters of its free fall, minimum free fall. And as a result, the AED activated. It's a fun jumper. This video was given to us with permission from, oh, from a test jumper's perspective, okay? This is, I think, a fantastic opportunity for us to recognize that it doesn't matter how experienced we are, it doesn't matter how many skydives we have, it's not just other people, it's not just students that these things happen to. When we look at high performance canopy flight, when we think about someone who just got their brand new JVX or their brand new Valkyrie and they make a big turn for the first time and they have an AD <coughs> activation, you could look at them and go, well, you didn't know how fast that was going. You didn't maybe necessarily understand the integration of your sport AED versus swooping. But take this to a level of canopy testing. If it can happen at this level, if it can happen at a level of the people who are designing the parachutes that we're using in conjunction with the ADs, what to take away from this is it can happen to anybody. <laughs> so. So that photo and the video are designed to illustrate the idea that swooping activations can and will continue to happen as long as we continue to put our, our canopies in a position to exceed the operating parameter speeds and altitudes. If you find yourself even remotely close to that position, what should you be doing? Not putting the AD in a position to activate in that scenario. Find out what those speeds are, what those altitude losses are, using your Flytech GPS or whatever else swoopers use today to record their, um, their successes. What do we n not want to do, it's not proper English, what do we not want to do is find out live on a jump with an uh, AED unit that we've now exceeded its operating parameters by making a big turn on a small parachute. Hank, you had a comment? I don't know what the version of the AD was. Okay, the next slide, increase in recommended main deployment altitudes to 2,500 feet. So in the United States, USPA, uh, we changed our minimum deployment altitudes a few years ago to 2,500 feet for experienced skydivers, delicensed expert skydivers. And the rationale behind that was twofold. One, for as long as we can remember, USPA's minimum recommended decision altitude has always been 1,800 feet. And what's a decision altitude? The altitude we decide our main parachute is no longer a viable option to land safely, and we execute our emergency procedures. <coughs> All throughout that time period, the minimum deployment altitude was 2,000 feet recommended. So what's the math on that? 200 feet, right? 
the only canopies that open in less than 200 feet are base canopies, right? With no sliders, <laughs> packed nose open. The math didn't work. You could not have a minimum deployment altitude of 2,000 feet and a minimum breakaway altitude of 1,800 feet and allow the main parachutes enough time to manifest themselves into either a flying successful main parachute or a malfunctioning parachute for you to <coughs> break away at that altitude. So what was happening? We were seeing lower than 1,800 foot decision altitudes because of that minimum deployment altitude. And we were also seeing at the time there were a, a number of activations of low altitude deployments where there wasn't enough time for the deployment process to complete. So we raised the minimum to 2,500 feet, and now parachutes have 700 feet, which is a reasonable, still quick, but a reasonable time frame. If you're deploying at the minimum 2,500 feet and 1,800 is still your decision altitude, you now have 700 feet to allow that main parachute to um, open and deploy cleanly or decide if you want to get rid of it. So let me ask you, how many of you here have a good idea of how long it takes your parachute to open? That's good. I'm glad to hear that we have a lot of people, or glad to see we have a lot of people who understand that. Because we're coming up to a point about compatibility, two outs, the AED fire during main deployments. But the key point here is that the altitudes that we're talking about, 750 feet, 840 feet, those are minimum altitudes. Those are minimum altitudes if everything goes correct and goes right after the deployment initiation occurs. The remainder of the process should have enough time to open a parachute and give you three to eight to ten seconds of canopy flight. What we're seeing today is that more and more skydivers are making a decision to raise their minimum deployment altitudes and also raise their AED activation altitudes from these absolute minimums of 750 and 840 feet to higher numbers like 1,000 foot back to earth, 1,100 foot back to earth, and thereby increasing their belly to earth deployment altitudes to the 1,200 and 1,300 foot range. We'll talk about why on the next slide people are doing that. It's not to say you need to, simply to have you consider that possibility. All manufacturers of ADs now allow for these offsets to be uh, put in and potentially used. So why would we have potentially a delay in a reserve deployment. In theory, once the AED cutter initiates the process, everything should happen perfectly each and every time, right? We spend a lot of money on our gear. It should work right every time, right? These are parachutes. We're lucky when they work every time we use them. So the reason for that component compatibility issue is that we have so many different options. There's probably 100 different harness containers on the market today. There's probably 10 different reserves that will fit in each one of those 100 different harness containers. You can have a, a firm fit, a soft fit, a moderate fit, low bulk fabric for reserves, full bulk fabric for reserves, anything in between. There's hundreds of main parachute combinations out there. I'm not smart enough to do the calculation, but if you take 100 plus harness containers with 100 plus reserve parachute combinations and then add 100 plus main container, uh, main canopy combinations with pack volumes and pressures and, and pack tray closure issues. There's so many different possible combinations of gear and who's responsible for determining which ones are compatible? We are in the field. Our riggers are, the people that put the gear together. So is it reasonable to assume then that certain combinations will have better results than others? If you overstuff your reserve and overstuff your main canopy into a really tight harness container and then have a reserve activation from a total where the main flaps aren't open, everything is packed nice and tight and secure, is it possible that that reserve deployment may or may not have the same outcome in time as a loose fitting reserve and a loose fitting main canopy in a pack tray that's that doesn't have the same friction or same issues um, during the deployment. There's so many different combinations out there and no one, not a single manufacturer or a single organization, USPA, BPA, no one has tested every possible configuration to every possible outcome. It would take millions of dollars to do that. What we use is good judgment and we use the knowledge base that we have, but based on the equipment that is currently in use and on in the field, but there is the potential you could stuff too tight of a reserve into a container, 
too loose of a mane, any combination. So how do you know? How do you know if the combination you have is suitable? It is a good fitting combination for that worst case scenario of an AD activation at 840 feet, 750 feet? Ask your riggers. As you, truly, you don't necessarily know, but we can talk to the people that have more experience, the people that put the gear together, people that, that build it for us, the people that install it for us. Get feedback, get information from the people that you work with or that you jump with. So quickly, we also have landing area offsets. Not everybody is lucky enough to land on the same drop zone they take off at. Um, Oftentimes, we take off from municipal airports and we land in farms and fields. There might be an altitude differential between our departure point and our landing area. Anyone that does demo jumps, I know the, the Red Devils are here. I'm sure their altitude from where they depart from and where they land isn't always the same, so they're probably looking at altitude differentials each time they're planning a demo jump. My favorite, of course, the one I'm married to is the terrain differential. Um, this is a pretty drastic example of terrain, but there are lots of drop zones that might have 750 foot hills or mountains beside the runways. And if you have an AD activation over one of those hills at 750 feet, and the AD is designed to deploy at 840 feet, where have you put yourself? You've put yourself in a position where the remainder of that process, the deployment process, does not have enough altitude to finish to a successful completion. So thinking about the world around us, the buildings, the terrain, the hills, so I keep talking about this reserve deployment sequence and the necessity for it to have a completed process after the reserve deployment initiation by the AED should it reach those parameters. Once an AED decides to activate, assuming that a loop has been placed through the cutter, and assuming that the cutter goes through and it cuts the loop and we have a clean break of the loop, now the reserve is free to enter the universe. It's free to come out and see the world. But in order for that to happen, five things still need to occur. Now, I want you guys to imagine this. We're having this nice conversation in a heated or air-conditioned room, depending upon your preference. We can talk about this process very calmly and very slowly. But when this is happening in the real world, when it's needed to save your life, it's happening in a critical moment of time and space where every half a second, every split second involved in that process can be the difference between life and death. Can be the difference between a successful reserve deployment, the slider being up versus the slider being down, and what that means to you in terms of injuries if you hit the ground in either configuration. This five-step process is critical after the AD activates. The first thing that has to happen is the reserve pilot chute has to launch off your back. Reserve pilot chute brings out the bridle. The bridle then has to leave. The bridle reaches extension. What comes next? The bag. What's inside the bag? The canopy. But before we can see the canopy, what has to happen? The lines have to reach line stretch. And then the locking stows and the free bags, or the free stows, excuse me, on the, the free bag, they release and out comes the reserve parachute. Is it possible for that to occur in different combinations? Can the bridle come out before the pilot chute? It can if the pilot chute gets hung up on a flap. Can the lines come out before the bag? That's a pretty scary one. All these sorts of things can occur, and it's not just packing issues. We have another issue to deal with. What could cause, by no fault of our amazing riggers, what could cause an out-of-sequence deployment on a main or reserve parachute? Being on your back, you're your orientation for sure, how the reserve is being deployed, but where I'm going with this for our thought process is the burble behind us. Have you guys ever seen wingsuits deploy with uh, main canopies into a big burble? If you haven't, I have a video I'm gonna show you. But I want you to think about the burble, the dead airspace behind you during this process, during this low altitude critical moment. If you're flying a wingsuit, Imagine this is your reserve parachute. Imagine this is your reserve parachute. You're at a critical moment. Every half a second matters. Okay. 
There have been a handful of AED activations on wingsuits over the last few years that have resulted where we've had fatalities that had an AED activation, but the reserve parachute did not have the necessary altitude to reach its full deployment. And in all the research and all the video footage that have been available to those that are investigating these, the presumed primary root cause was the burble that the reserve was being put into onto those massive wingsuits. So if you're jumping a massive wingsuit, which is a good thing, the technology is fantastic in that area, but understand that if you have a low altitude deployment of a reserve, that wingsuit might be creating such a large burble behind you that it might delay or pause or impede that reserve deployment sequence by a half a second, a second, a second and a half. And that might be the difference between the reserve reaching a clean full deployment versus unfortunately reaching the ground before it has an opportunity to do so. So understanding the burble that can be created by our bodies, the wingsuit's a drastic example. There's also body position as well. One of the best possible body positions for normal skydivers to see a, a pilot chute launch off our back is what? In a seated position, right? Because the reserve is launching off into clean airspace. What's one of the more um, verbal causing body positions in reserve deployments? Perfect. Belly to earth, the perfect box man, like the story I told you early today. Any of you guys ever do AFF with spring-loaded pilot chutes? Your AFF instructors out there? What happens to the spring-loaded pilot chute when it comes off your back? It comes right back down again, and you play pilot chute tennis or pilot chute ping pong. You bat it across the burble with each other, and eventually it takes off. So much so that some organizations like USPA realize that let's get rid of one of the two instructors during the deployment so we can get some clean air. So now we have the main side departing during the deployments so that clean air can get on the back of the student. Now, it's kind of comical to talk about pilot shoot ping pong with two AFF instructors, but imagine that pilot shoot. It's the same pilot shoot on your reserve, cylindrical launched pilot shoot that we used to have on the original AFF sport rigs for main canopies. That's still on your back today. It has mass, it has weight, it has to clear your burble. So if you're a big, massive person and you're falling very fast, what's going on behind you? You have a big burble behind you. And that reserve pilot shoot needs to clear that burble before it's allowed to proceed with that sequence of pilot shoot, bridle, line, pilot shoot, bridle, bag, line, canopy. We talked earlier about free fall speeds, the slow lane versus the fast lane. In the context of an AD activation, keeping in mind, I'm gonna keep kind of hammering this home, these AD activation altitudes are the last possible moment where we can have a clean, positive outcome of our deployment system for our reserve, assuming everything goes right. But what if we turn up the speed? What if we start going faster than that 120 miles an hour that we originally thought about back in the 1990s. What if someone's going 180 miles an hour? They're now traveling 30 to 50% faster. Loss of altitude awareness can happen head down just as easily as it can happen on other orientations. So if we're traveling through 1,000 feet, traveling at 180 miles an hour, we have a reserve deployment at that airspeed that's 30 to 50% faster than our normal airspeeds. What does that do to our window of opportunity for the AD to activate? It narrows it considerably, right? What, what's that? Well, I'd rather have a reserve deploy at 180 miles an hour than no reserve deploying at 180 miles an hour. I'll take my chances there. But I, a good point to bring up, though. <coughs> really, what I just want to emphasize here is that if you are a head down free flyer and you're reaching speeds of 180, 190 miles an hour, if you're that good of a skydiver to be able to do that, you're probably thinking an AD activation is not something on my radar. That'll happen to someone else. It's not going to happen to me. But we know, based on the math and the data, that we're all capable of having loss of altitude awareness, making mistakes, being caught behind the power curve, so to speak. So if you are regularly flying at 180 miles an hour, and there's a possibility that you could experience altitude loss awareness, excuse me, altitude that you could experience a loss of altitude awareness. I would ask you simply to think about what will your AED do for you at its current intended activation altitude at that speed of 180 miles an hour if it were to deploy 
at that speed and that altitude. And then make a reasonable assumption on where your risk level lies within that decision or that outcome. This is my favorite thing. I left it towards almost the end. This is, one of the, for me, one of the most critical issues with our current state of skydiving as it relates to AD activations. Close our eyes, we visualize a scenario. We've lost altitude awareness. We've blown through 2,000 feet. We realize we're at 1,500 feet, we're belly to earth. What are we going to do? We're gonna reach back or we're gonna throw our main pilot chute because that's what we've done 13,000 times, that's what we've done 8,000 times, what we've done 200 times or 21,000 times. We've thrown pilot chutes so many times in our lives and how rarely do we actually deploy our reserve? Almost never, maybe once in 1,000 jumps, once in 5,000 jumps. The psychology of that traumatic moment when we realize we're falling through 1,500 feet and we have not put a parachute over our head is to reach back and deploy the main. I wanna show you what that looks like. It's a two by four. We get two people that both lost altitude and awareness. They both rolled over or they both deployed their main parachutes below their breakaway or their decision altitudes. And they both ended up with two outs because at that low altitude, instead of going straight for the reserve, they put a main parachute over their head and experienced an AD activation. Now, those of you that read dropzone.com, there's a incident posted on there right now in the incident forums about an AFF instructor who chased down a student and losing or a student or having to chase a student, that's just part of being an AFF instructor. That's gonna happen from time to time, we know that. So no issue there. Gets to the student, deploys the student, the student's up, the instructor rolls over low and deploys the main parachute and ends up with an AD activation, a two out situation. This is within the last couple of months this happened. The two out ends up in a down plane, the instructor down planes in the ground and has a broken leg or has some serious injuries that they're recovering from today. So I offer you that example because here's two fun jumpers losing altitude awareness. They both end up with two outs, the two by four, four parachutes, two people. But it's not just other people. If it can happen to an AFF instructor, it can happen to anybody. We have to take a moment of pause and think about that moment that critical moment of loss of altitude awareness that we're all capable of experiencing. And when we find ourselves below our decision altitudes, what is the outcome? What is the, the ramification of throwing my main pilot chute versus deploying my reserve parachute? We see two outs time and time again when this situation occurs. Thankfully, we have some video to show now today, but this is one of the most common malfunctions of a system, and the system is not the equipment, the system is our thought process. That deploying a main parachute with not enough altitude to prevent an AED fire th that ensures the AED will fire puts us in a position to have to now deal with a two out parachute configuration which can lead to a down plane, can lead to other problems and other issues. So think about that in terms of your skydiving and ask yourself that question. If you're taking mental notes, what would you do if you rolled over and it was 1300 feet and you had to put a parachute over your head. Yes, Hank. I was sure that you talked about altitude awareness. I, I had this situation myself. Uh, I did not know I was low. So I had exactly the same thing. Yeah. So I asked myself, the people that have this situation, oh yeah, I was low, but did you realize you were low? Yeah. That's the other thing, if you know, because then you're not loss of altitude anymore. You yep. now know you're low, so it's not loss of altitude awareness at that moment. So yep. then you can make a thought process, Myself to activate yep. If you don't know you're low, you The criticalness of understanding your altitudes. So I'm going to wrap this up because we're at an hour. Um, I've been saying this for years. Knowledge is power. Lack of knowledge is not an excuse. The information is out there. All the manufacturers of ADs have websites with manuals you can download that clearly illustrate the arming, activation, and deactivating or disarming parameters of the equipment. 
parachutes we jump, we can determine their air speeds using GPS. If you're jumping a high performance parachute, you owe it to yourself to get that fly tech information to find out what your descent rates are, what you're capable of. So read the manuals, ask questions amongst the people around you that have more experience. The most critical thing here though is line item number three. This is the polar opposite end of the spectrum from set it and forget it. I'm asking you, I'm, I'm pleading with you, be the next generation of skydivers that is not a set it and forget it mentality. You are an understanding the equipment I'm using mentality. Do not be the person that puts your system and puts yourself in a parameter outside of its intended operating envelope because you didn't know what that operating envelope was or that, that the equipment you were using was being operated outside of that envelope. That is the critical knowledge base. And if you have that knowledge base, you will drastically reduce the probability that you will be the next I love skydiving or Friday freakout video that we end up seeing on the internet. So the question I will leave you with that I'm not going to answer it because it's not for me to answer. It's for you to think about long and hard because it's going to affect your career as a skydiver. Are you comfortable with the current activation altitudes of your equipment? And most of you, the answer will remain yes, and that's a good thing. As long as you know that that's the answer and you know why that's the answer, that I will have succeeded in my job today. But some of you might find that an increase in your deployment altitude or activation altitude of your AD may fit into your day-to-day -day skydiving and may be the better choice for you. And if you do that based on the understanding of how the AD works, how your equipment around it works, and you're making a sound logical decision based on that, then that will remove you from the probability of being in the position to place it in a scenario where you could have an inadvertent activation. So at the end of the day, going back to the story I told, it doesn't matter what the situation is, what the scenario, wingsuit, whatever, don't ever give up. Don't ever stop fighting to pull that reserve handle. That's your last resort. The AD is only a backup. Your primary source of defense in every skydive is your brain and what you can do with that. Rely on that one first and the AD second. So, it's been an hour. I thank you guys. Uh, privilege talking to you. Hopefully you're going to leave here with some thoughts and ideas. Whether you agree or disagree, that's entirely up to you. But take this conversation home. Talk to other people around you. You might inspire someone else to learn more about their AEDs and it might save them from an accidental activation or might save their life in a situation where they do come to rely on the AED from incapacitation or some other reason. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I know we have another presentation coming in 13 minutes. So I thank you. I'm here for you. And if you have a question one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be out in the hallway if anybody wants to talk further on it. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>